Now, here's the thing. I will say for the millionth time, Jubilee, fly me out. Put me on the show. I, I'll destroy on this show. I would destroy on some Jubilee. Until we used he, him pronouns. I don't even know where to start here. Let me just go. Antidepressants back. weren't working. We'd been to every so single like therapist and nothing was touching it until we used he, him pronouns. I don't even know where to start here. Sex is not assigned at birth. It's established at conception. We have to get to biology here. Today we're bringing a new. I'm sorry. He said what? Sex is not established at conception. It's lit it's quite literally not established at. Con they have a host now. Middle ground has a host. I don't like that. Is that because they, they got to be doing the host now because their middle grounds have been getting so fucking. Um, what's the word I'm looking for out of pocket? If you remember, if you saw the Blair White middle ground, that's got to be why they have a host. New version of Middle Ground will be exploring the topic, should minors be allowed to medically transition? We'll be introducing an undecided yes. group and they'll be listening to a discussion between liberals and conservatives and the undecided group will pick a side after oh, each prompt. Oh, Jubilee, I don't like this. I don't like this format, Jubilee. Uh, I don't like this one. I don't like this format, bro. I'm not a fan. Transitioning has become a social media trend. Absolutely agree. I mean, it is just skyrocketing the oh, amount of children that you see falling into this, and we need to stop it. Absolutely not. People said the same thing about people coming out being lesbian, gay, or bisexual as it got more normalized, as people became more accepting of like their right. children and things like that. They're like, everybody wants to be gay. Now, social media is around, people my age, like we see other trans people, and being aware that that's something that's being accepted by other people makes you more comfortable with yourself and like comfortable with like internalizing I that it. Well, first of all, first of all, let me, let me, let's, because we're going to analyze some of the things that are being said. I don't like this question to begin with. Transitioning has become a social media trend. No, it's just that we have social media now, right? Like you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta think of it this way. These, <laughs> these things weren't prevalent to most people. In fact, I would even go as to say, it's not even that there are more trans people now. It's just that you're more likely to see it because of social media. It's okay to be trans so in public. I think you're falling no, prey like to the question. survivorship bias, which is just sort of, you're overlooking all of the cases of people who either weren't able to come out because they weren't comfortable or hey, safe to do so, or they either bias? died okay, due to go. suicide or other mental health reasons. But over time, if you look at left-handedness, that hey, skyrocketed left in a similar rate as people became more accepting to it. Well, I, I, challenge, I, I reject that. But, the let me ask you something. If that's the case, if more people are transitioning simply because it it's more acceptable, mm -hmm. then how can your side also say that there's a trans genocide happening? Those are completely opposite. No, I know TikTok, you did, know but, you're, you but the people, but liberals say that all the time. I They're mean, saying that there's a trans genocide because of, for some reason. So I'm just oh, curious she's back, as bro. to how you I would square that it. circle. Uh, we, she was, she's a, a trans conservative. She was terrible in the last episode with Blair. She was absolutely terrible. Find what the trans genocide, I guess, narrative is as raised by her. I would like her to answer that because she's the one that brought it up. Yeah, because so we hear people saying That's because so simply so because good. legislation is being passed across the country that is banning minors from being able to transition, that automatically means that those children would commit suicide. And that is simply an abusive statement in of itself. Statistically, a lot of minors who aren't able to transition who would like to do end up. Why don't we That's have this? Why don't we have it's this? Why don't we have the same Science suicide rates in the past? We that we that were that we if, if that was the case how Let's could we point. how could we have known that the people who were committing suicide were transgender if they didn't feel safe to come out we look at like tammy that's where it's at that's the question i was gonna ask right they always say they always say like well the suicide rates aren't the same but we don't know that because the kids didn't come out back then they were afraid to come out so you actually have no idea they absolutely color coded on purpose, by the way, 100%. They have no idea whether or not these people were actually coming, were actually trans or not. Oh, Tammy. Mm. Snaps. Like, uh, members Real of each generation that identify as LGBTQ or in that community, it's like less than 2%. On, and then for some reason, as soon as we get to Generation Z, yeah, it's 20%. Huge. Now, some of you may argue, okay, this is just because it's more open, it's more accepting now, everyone, it's okay to be that. But then in the same beat, you guys will say, that if you don't yeah, accept yeah. them, so they're more likely to nice. commit suicide or something. But it kind of sounds like a 
Double-edged sword. So that didn't sound double-edged to me. It, it sounded pretty accurate. Like if you're not accepting of somebody, they're more likely to be self-hating. Like if you're telling somebody that they're not allowed to do something, they shouldn't do something, they're not fitting into their own body, especially experiencing dysphoria in itself. It's a mental battle in general. Like. So, okay. so to clarify your point, I think you're saying that acceptance is what's leading to it. Is that right? It, I... It's a, a mixture between self-acceptance, outer acceptance. It's the conversation between nature and nurture. Like, See, it, here's the problem with that. There have been two, there's two longitudinal studies alone that I could cite. In Sweden, from 1973 to 2003. He's going to misquote the Sweden study. He's going to misquote the Sweden study. Why is it always this? Why, are they always, why do they always misquote the Sweden study? Why is that conservatives go to? is to misrepresent the Sweden study. They looked at a large number of subjects who had before transition and after transition, and they had m worse comorbidities, they had no, worse they mental health not. issues. Sweden is a- No, they didn't. Holy fuck, dude. Do I need to pull the Sweden study up? First and foremost, one of the things we have to mention is the Sweden study is, is, uh, was a different method of care. So when people look at the study that comes out of Sweden, it was, we don't care for them the way they, oh, Aaron has the word for it. I don't even remember what the word for it. But care is more individualized now, as opposed to when the Sweden study was gone through. Like we've literally switched the form of care. So to, it's just a, it's a gross misrepresentation of what that study is actually telling you. And the study even says, hold on, let me pull up the, God, let me pull up the damn study. Give me a second. Oh, not me searching on Fiverr. Trying to find people to do commissions. Give me a second. Let me pull it up. So this is the study they're talking about really quickly. Long-term follow-up of transsexual persons undergoing sex reassignment surgery cohort study in Sweden. Right? So this is the study that they're talking about. Okay? Now, we can go to the conclusions. Persons with transsexualism after sex reassignment have considerably higher risks for mortality, suicide behavior, and psychiatric morbidity than the general population. Our findings suggest that sex reassignment, although alleviating gender dysphoria, may not suffice as treatment for transsexualism and should inspire improved psychiatric and somatic care after sex reassignment for the patient. So this is what I'm saying. They misquote the Sweden study all the fucking time. So the Sweden study is not saying that you have more risk for these things after you transition. No, they're saying that you still have a higher risk than the general population. And we need to couple sexual reassignment with, um, and here I'll highlight it just so people are aware of what I'm reading. You have to couple uh, reassignment surgery with therapy and psychiatric treatment. Like, uh, this is what blows my mind. Is is And this is, I, I guess it's not... It's not Jubilee's fault, but like it's kind of Jubilee's fault. Like you let him just grossly say something false and there's no fact checking. There's no fact checking. So you have this group of people who are sitting on the fence and trying to determine this thing, but he just said something that's not true. And, and we'll watch, I guess we'll see if he gets fact checked for it, but this absolutely isn't true. It's not what the Sweden study says. It's a very tolerant, liberal, progressive country. A study this year published in Denmark, 2023, 42-year longitudinal study. And what they found is that the mental health issues did not decline. They actually were augmented. It was worse for individuals who thought that by trans... Okay, so now he's saying there's a Denmark 2023 study. So let's look this up. It said it's a longitudinal study. Because I'm sure this one also isn't isn't saying what he th what he thinks it's saying. Uh, so this is gender affirming treatment and mental health diagnoses in Danish transgender persons, a nationwide register based. It's a register based cohort study. Gender affirming treatment aims to improve mental health to investigate longitudinal mental health outcomes in Danish transgender persons. National register based cohort study in Danish transgender persons with a diagnosis code of gender identity disorder. Well, that right there shows that it's a little behind the times because it, it, there's no such thing as gender identity disorder anymore. Uh, during the period 2000 2021 uh, participant five age matched controls of the same sex at birth and five age matched controls of the other sex at birth were included for each transgender person. So they, okay. Diagnosis codes for mental and behavioral disorder. Got it. Results. The cohort included 3,812 3, transgender persons with median age, 19 years for persons assigned female at birth and 23 years for persons assigned male at birth and 38, uh, 120 or 3,800, what? 3,800. Oh, I'm so confused. And 38, 120 controls. Oh, 
I see what they're saying. Sorry, sorry. So 19 through and 38. Got it. Uh, thank you for the gift on, on TikTok. Thank you so much. Uh, follow-up duration was up to 10 years with a mean standard deviation 4.5 years. And transgender person's AFAP compared to control limb, the odds, so here, the odds ratio for mental and behavior disorders was 6.7 before the index date at one year at five years and 3.4 at eight years follow-up. So it did go down. Current version AMAB compared to control min corresponding ORs were 5.0, 11.3, 4.8, and 6.6 at eight-year follow-up, all P uh, less than 0.001. The conclusions, the OR for mental health disorders was higher in transgender person compared to controls and remained elevated throughout the follow-up, especially. So again, this also isn't saying what he said it's saying. All this study is saying is that mental health issues are higher amongst transgender individuals, which we all knew. He just made up he just made up two things about two different studies and lied because it's higher in transgender people than it is in people that are not trans. Yes, we know this. But the study isn't making any conclusions why it's higher. Come on. And it says remained elevated, but you can clearly see that it, it's it's lower. Like it might be elevated, but it's lower. He just lied. My God. Positioning, they would solve their mental health issues. It actually got worse. It doesn't help. It doesn't solve these issues. No, you, it shows no, it's no. a contagion. You lied, my guy. You lied. You literally lied. Yeah, he lied. He lied. He lied. So great. You lied. Agent, that is the key word. Let's let's pause there then. What are your guys' thoughts on, let's say, maybe that's a pretty popular figure that's been mentioned when it comes to a social media influencer that has risen to fame because of that. She's just doing what she's doing. I don't think that she's doing anything wrong. Okay, he. Do you think that has... My pronouns are she, her. They're talking about, they're, talk, they're absolutely talking about uh, Dylan. That's transphobic. Do you, think, do you think that has inspired uh, trans kids? I think she's also... Okay, so first of all, Jubilee, fuck, you do kind of a bad job at protecting the individuals on this panel. That's all I'm going to say. So inspired allies to see the human being behind the pronouns and the makeup and the dress and to see that there's someone who is going through a story and that watching her go through that story that enabled us to see the humanity studies. behind her. He gonna, is degrading gonna, women. You see a great disregard. I mean, look at the look at the product that he was supposed to be promoting. It has fallen she, into her so, pronouns um, are she. And, and with all due respect to me, it like isn't phobic to speak them the truth. Not OK, your host is terrible he's not what the fuck bro okay <laughs> that's not a phobia let's Telling stop the here there's not a phobia let's stop here and let's uh go over to the undecided group oh my god dude they all need right to get so undecided group you guys are kind of like the common section which side did you resonate with most liberals or conservatives No way. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. So why did you resonate most with the liberal group? Trends pass. Mm. Trends end. So calling it a trend is saying that these people's identities this are just so, going to go away. This and is I such don't a think worse structure for Why show, not going do you think that it's not transphobic to misgender? Because is the show, concept of misgendering is false. There are two sexes. There's male and female. Well, it's, it's, it's in the chromosomes. It goes beyond superficial or secondary oh, I character. Would hand, I would hand this old bastard his ass. <laughs> I would hand him his ass, dude. Characteristics. He is a male. He was born a male. He will remain a male. It doesn't matter how many chemicals he puts into his body or how many body parts are cut off. And I'll say this again. Telling the truth is not a mental illness. Do you have a response to that? Yeah. Um, I think that there is a difference between sex and gender. And I know you're going to disagree with me. But transgender is. is its own thing. And he there can, is. She can be. See? No, don't try to blame that on me. You are using the wrong pronouns for this woman. And you're trying to... No. Influence something. Do you have just, a specific question that you like to ask the liberal group? I would just like to hear more from them because I feel like it was very one-sided. Thank you. Yeah, because conservatives don't let people speak. We know this. Fuck, dude. Somebody get grandpa out okay. of here. So you sat more on the conservative side. Do you want to explain why you decided to come here? Yeah, um, so I think 
I mean, there are, I mean, it is just factual that there are more people transitioning or at least coming out, not even just as transgender, but just, you know, within the LGBTQ community as a whole. And so yeah, I, I do agree. see, I you, you know, I think for me, it does become a little bit grayer when you start to say, okay, is that because people are being like influenced to transition or is it because it's more accepting and people are feeling more open and safe about coming out? And I think, you know, when you're in, you know, a friend group or when you, you know, associate with certain people, I think you are likelier to maybe, you know, explore your gender a little bit more or, you know, look more into those avenues. And I think that can influence someone to transition if, you know, maybe beforehand that wouldn't have been a consideration. Do you have a specific question that you'd like to ask either side? Yeah, I guess I would like to ask, you know, the liberal side, you know, and I can't necessarily trace it back to a specific time when this happened, but I do think we have seen recently, you know, a rise in people identifying with genders that aren't necessarily within a binary. Would you say that's a rise? You know, how would you, I guess, account for that? I think, as I said earlier, that is just accounted by survivorship bias. People previously were not comfortable enough with coming out, and that's where that difference comes from. And eventually, that skyrocketing what, what their rate will are, even out. Fucking, so. um, I definitely do think that that is kind of a factor of it. That I mean, you know, people are just coming out more and are feeling more accepted. I absolutely do believe that. You know, that is a good that social media has done. But I do also kind of push back on the idea that it's just completely that. Like I. You know, when you look at figures who, you know, rise to prominence, like, for example, so Dil um, Dylan Mulvaney, you. you know, these are people with huge platforms that, you know, are reaching to, you know, younger people who are at stages in their lives Wait, where, you know, they are. This is not a bad thing. This is what's so confusing to me. It's not a bad, it, I'm not even going to say confusing. It's not a bad thing that kids are introduced to other identities and they may see themselves right? They may see themselves in those other identities. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Like at all, you're, you're, you're trying to put this, um, in saying transitioning has become a social media trend. The conservative side is trying to make a moral claim that it's wrong that these kids are seeing themselves this way, but it's just, it doesn't hold water. There's nothing to show that. You're just saying things. Exploring ideas of gender and gender expression and identity. And so, I guess personally, I would push back a little bit against the idea that it's just people who had it been more accepting in the past, they would have come out. I do think there is, you know, a rise. I mean, I feel like the numbers just don't really account for it necessarily being just that group of people. I think there are people, especially youth, who are identifying more kind of on the gender spectrum or as transgender that maybe wouldn't have before. So you're the only undecided. Because they don't, they didn't know about it. How can you, okay, let's say we have a hundred kids. <laughs> I can't believe, I can't believe we have to go through this. Let's say we have a hundred kids and these kids are fresh out the womb and we never introduce them to the idea of trans being trans. We never even introduce the idea that you can be anything other than your biological sex at birth. A group of those kids are not going to feel that way. And now they're going to feel ostracized and othered. And it's very unlikely that they are going to show you who they truly are even though, and, they, and they're gonna have no concept to even talk to you about who they might truly be. That's what it was like. That's why, and I say this all the time, if you look at, at trends of like trans people that were coming out, you had mostly adults, 80s and prior, 90s and prior even, it was mostly adults that came out. And first of all, all of those adults are gonna tell you, I was trans as a kid. I was trans. I just didn't have the words for it. Then they grew up and they got the words for it. So they were able to act, they were able to like identify who they were. That's the issue with what's going on right now in this video is, is they're equating because more kids are coming out that it's that more p trans is like, uh, they call it a social contagion. So being trans is a social contagion and more people are coming out and it's so bad, but like, that's not what's actually happening. People just have the words now to accurately identify themselves. That's what's happening. Can you clarify why you still remain undecided? Um, yeah, I think the reason I remained undecided was because although I appreciate um, the presentations of both sides and I see both their points, I was still a little bit unclear um, as far as which what like each opinion was on each side. So um, I would just be curious to huh? ask the liberal side: what? Do you guys is there any huh? like evidence that you guys could present what? that would suggest um, that transitioning lowers the rate of suicide? I would say on one hand, there there is data that suggests that um, trans minors who are not able to yes. medically fuck. Hold on, I'm going to answer this question uh, because I'm at a computer and they're not. So if you go to my handy dandy source document, 
which is right here, Jovan's handy dandy source document. This is one of two. This is the incomplete one, but the trans section is pretty much complete with all my updated stuff. If you go to LGBTQIA plus issues, if you go to transgender information and you go to psychological so or gender affirming care, here are so many. I have mental health outcomes in transgender, non-binary use, receiving gender affirming care, association of gender affirming hormone therapy with depression, thoughts of suicide and attempted suicide among transgender, non-binary youth, association between gender affirming surgeries and mental health outcomes, mental health of transgender children who are supported in their identities, pubertal suppression for transgender youth and risk of suicide ideation, risk and resilience factors for mental health among transgender and gender non-conforming TGNC youth, a system, a system, a systematic review, early access to testosterone therapy in transgender, gender diverse adults seeking masculinization, short-term outcomes of pubertal suppression in a select cohort of 12 to 15 year old young people with persistent gender dysphoria in the UK. And that was it. So I have all of these sources, right? And every single one of them kind of says the same thing. Gender affirming healthcare, specifically medical affirming healthcare, when you have severe gender dysphoria, alleviates mental health issues and, and suicidality. It doesn't get rid of it, but it helps alleviate it. Dunked on. Transition when they do want to, their suicidality um, attempt rate is around 40%, and that drops to below 10% when they are able to transition. Moreover, if I wouldn't, wasn't able to transition and I didn't have any support in my life, I would probably kill myself. The conservatives, uh, they, ain't have, were just, they ain't have shit to say to that. They were like, well, that kind of defeats my whole, my whole argument. <laughs> discussing social media contagion, could you present any other like arena as far as um, other instances where we've seen social media have that influence on? I'd teams. love to add, just every aspect of mainstream media. So um, CNN, like all mainstream news sources, um, when we talk about even like major corporations, we have Pride Month for God's sake, right? We have an entire month where all corporations, all major corporations, even the government, you know, President Joe Biden is putting a pride flag. It seems like every aspect of our like top- He's me, he's me. I'll be doing the same shit. I'll just start laughing because he's not saying anything. Joe Biden is putting a pride flag. It seems like every aspect of our like top dog, like main people in society Yo, are promoting it, right? Fuck. And then if you go down to like social media, um, everyone's promoting it, right? Each Instagram, t or not maybe not this Twitter isn't anymore, answering X the question now, by the way. But TikTok, there's there's trends, there's um, things that are happening where people are talking about the LGBTQ, and to him, that's a social media contagion. Notice how he didn't explain why it's a contagion. He's just saying, well, all of these people are talking about it. So you're just not a fan of people talking about identities you don't like. That doesn't tell me that it's a contagion. That tells me that you're an asshole. <laughs> it is being promoted. And the fact that there's influencers, I think, is just proving the fact that it is indeed a trend. Gender dysphoria is he a He said a whole illness. lot of nothing there. It is a break with reality. I'll start at where I've said before. There are two sexes. It's determined not just by external characteristics, but by chromosomes. When somebody dies and is buried, and 400 years later, if they exhume the body and they test those bones, they're going to see that it's an XX or an XY, some male or a female. It's Did he just say that they do chromosome? Or is he, is he claiming that what happens is they, they archaeologists unearth a body, right? Follow me on this line, of this line of thought. What he's claiming is archaeologists unearth a body, then they test, they karyotype the bones? Is that what he's claiming right now? Is that we do karyotyping on bones? Now, I don't know enough about bones, but that just doesn't sound right. How do archaeologists determine gender of bones? Sex is typically determined by the morphology or shape of the pelvis or skull and long bone measurements. Fuck, dude, this dude is saying so much nothing. Why are, Jubilee, why are you just letting him say so much actively incorrect shit? They don't karyotype the bones. They just look at how the bones are shaped, which they get wrong all the time. It's a mental issue, and you want to treat it that way. Fuck. You treat it with counseling, with therapy, reflecting reality, helping the person be a, to be comfortable with the sex that they're born with. Sex. What do you guys think about that? Um, uh, it's calling it a mental illness. Yes, yeah, so I want to respond to your comment about bones and skeletons. Please get on I his study ass. Bio, um, at the get on his ass, Kimmy! They're moving in a direction where they're using terminology like assumed or, or estimated gender. 
because there is large um, overlap between the general sort of uh, estimations. Also, no one's going to dig up someone's bones unless they've already consented to donating their skeleton somewhere. No one just goes gra grave robbing for that. But that's that's well, it, that's let's, irrelevant. Let's hear, let's hear well, a little bit. Point it's is it's irrelevant to bring it up. Get then. on his no, ass. No, 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 it is relevant to point out that sex is determined at birth and it doesn't change. But what's the point? Wait, okay, so now sex is determined at birth. You said sex was determined at conception, which is also fully not fucking true. Like the most untrue shit I've ever heard. You're making with the skeleton example. The point that it doesn't change even over long periods of time. I'd like to Thank hear you. a little bit more from Thank you for your both of you. If you, you're walking around life constantly being told something like what you're supposed to identify as and you feel other than, like of course, as time goes on, you're gonna feel worse and worse about that specific thing. I don't think there's a reason to transition if you don't have a mental illness. Like, there's something wrong in That's your like brain. That's like saying you that, shouldn't cut no. your hair because you don't no. want long hair. Wow, that is so not a comparison. No. So, so when, when, wow, when, when, I hate when him. you, oh I mean, my when, God, I, oh my God. Someone find him, find him, find, I want this man, I want this man to try to debate me in the arena of ideas. I really want him to pull up these studies that he lied about or I'll, let's 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 not assume ill intent. Although I'm pretty sure there's ill intent here. I want him to pull up the studies that he maybe misrepresented, maybe didn't read fully. You know, maybe he didn't read it fully. But I'd like this motherfucker to try any of this with me. I'm sorry. The claim that oh, it's a mental illness. Let's 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 dig into that. First of all, what is a there is a difference between something being a mental illness and being a mental health disorder, in my view, right? Now we can say, we can say, well, let's let's lean towards the experts for whether this is a mental illness, which all the experts will say it's not. They'll all say it's not. Uh, I say it's a disorder of sex development. Some people just say it's a general disorder, but it, it's not a mental illness. Like not labeled that in any classification. So what is a mental illness? Well, a mental illness would, I mean, I'll pull it up. Hold on, let me pull it up. Because I like to really talk about the difference between like a mental illness and a mental health disorder. So. Um, uh, when we talk about mental illnesses, uh, they are, um, they affect how you perform in your daily life. They affect the way you hold down relationships. They affect the way you can care for yourself. Now, gender dysphoria can slightly affect these things, right? If your dysphoria is really bad one day, you might, it might lead to depressive thoughts. It might make it a little harder for you to get up, but gender dysphoria doesn't affect your personal relationships. It doesn't affect your ability to perform daily activities. Typically, it doesn't do any of these things. It's just a dis an incongruence and a distress, but it's not distress to the point where you have a mental illness. Like this is what's so mind boggling to me. When I, when it's, it's the opposite concept of gender or body dysmorphia. So when you look in the mirror and you see what's wrong with, like you see, you have an uncomfortability with your secondary sex characteristics. And so the treatment is to change that to m match with what you, what you want it to be. But I mean, he's right. You can't change your sex, but it's in the brain. You treat the body to help the brain. It's not any different. And, and honestly, I'm somebody who I don't think you should be, we should stigmatize mental illness. That's the whole point is, you know, I have anxiety, PTSD yeah, from when I was- he is, but he is stigmatizing it. He's saying it's wrong, it's bad, we need to convince, he's basically, not not her, but the other guy, the ball, ball head of motherfucker, is basically saying that we need to send all trans kids to conversion camps. Like that's that's what he's saying. He's saying we need to convince them that they are not trans. That's his That's his idea of how to fix the situation. Everything else. Hey, I don't think we the, should be stigmatizing mental run. illnesses. Um, and so I think that so calling it for what it is, is just accepting that. And it actually helps with treatment and to what you're treating, because you're treating the brain. You have to go to a therapist. You have to go all of that. So I, I think it's no issue to call it. I think- And I when think you treat the brain, you don't cut the body though. I mean, if somebody has bulimia or anorexia, you treat the reason why they perceive themselves incorrectly. Right. If somebody has dysmorphia, you don't say, well, just cut off a body part. But, Wait, this, but this isn't true. So there's a, there's a thing, it's called body integrity disorder, body integrity identity disorder. One of the treatments for body integrity, so body integrity identity disorder is this belief that your limb, like a limb is not yours. So you have this idea that your arm doesn't belong on your body, for instance. And so this can lead to, you know, a lot of the same things that gender dysphoria can lead to. It, a, a, a immense distress, you, you, have a, you have a distress about this piece of your body, and it can lead to bodily harm and, and self-mutilation. 
Now, one of the treatments for body integrity identity disorder, if it's severe enough, is to just cut off that part of the body. So doctors will just cut it off for you because it's better than you risking dangerous ways of harming yourself by cutting off the limb or doing one of the, that is one of the treatments. Be so for real. In some cases, amputation can result in remission of BIID. This is this man does not know what he's talking about. And he's up here proposing like he's an expert on these things and he's not. It's a complete violation of the Hippocratic Oath. Oh. Gender dysphoria is a mental health condition. And the treatment for this condition is to do a medical transition if that person chooses to have those procedures done. It won't go away with just a simple pill. It's gender dysphoria. It has nothing to do with sex and bones and, and your DNA. Do you think children are capable of making that decision? Let They're me, not. Let me pose a question. That's the beautiful thing, is kids aren't making the decision. Their doctors are. Their parents are, their endocrinologists, therapists, all of these major medical fields, they're making the decision. And then it's up to parents to decide. I say this all the time and I'm gonna say it again. When it comes to gender dysphoria, parents have a benefit risk analysis here. They go, if my child is at severe enough risk of self-harm, self-mutilation or suicide, what should I as the parent do? Now, me personally, right, I understand all the side effects that can come from certain gender-affirming healthcare treatments. I would so much rather have a kid who's alive and sterile than a kid who's dead. I'd rather have those two. I'd rather have that. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just Jovan. But, like, I'll take a sterile living kid over a dead kid 100% of the time. Homosexuality actually used to be considered as a mental illness. Hold on. Okay. It's just, it's just Kira trying to get into the room. Let's continue. Do you think there's any correlation here with what's going on currently with the trans movement? It, it, it has to do with the way you present yourself. And again, I, I call it sex dysphoria because it's dysphoria of your sex, but it has to do with your secondary sex characteristics that you're presenting to society. You know, in a lot of regards, and even Deborah So wrote this in End of Gender, she, she actually advocated for this because the same hormone imbalance in the womb that causes more, you know, femininity and homosexuality seems to be very similarly tied to gender dysphoria as well. It's just a, it's, it's a further step along the way. It's a further, you know, condition. And, and I, I agree where I use, I guess I use mental illness and mental health condition synonymously, essentially. So I think what's interesting about this topic is that, you know, we need to consider both statistics as well as personal anecdotes. If you guys don't mind, do you want to share a little bit about your personal experiences with this particular topic? Yeah, so I actually, I didn't even know that trans people existed until I was around like 19, I think. I just, that information never came to me. Um, I'm 25 right now. I didn't really realize I was trans until I was 22. And I started medically transitioning when I was 23. I've, I've experienced depression for most of my life, probably since I was like 13 or so. And um, a lot of suicidal ideation throughout high school and early in college. But pretty much around the time I had, I guess, felt comfortable with my, like where I'd gone in transitioning, that had largely decreased pretty much entirely. And this is, and this is what's interesting because I know when we talk about a lot of this stuff, um, every transsexual that I know that transi that you know, we started feeling dysphoria around the very time that we became self-aware, around the age of four years old. Um, but yeah, I mean, I knew around the age of four that there was something different. I wanted to be the opposite sex. I knew I wasn't the opposite sex, but it was something that I wished, you know, I could. I knew that there was something different. Um, and, you know, I tried to dress on at four years old and went from there and then transitioned later in life when, um, you know, I finally accepted it myself. I'd be curious to hear your perspective as someone, I think you mentioned that you have kids. 
uh, yeah. transition? Yes, I have that magical uterus. My eleven. My... Oh shit! Y'all found Bald Dude's Twitter or his or his Twitter? What's his Twitter? What's what's Bald Dude's Twitter? Fuck! Please tell me Bald Dude's Twitter, right now. I need to know what his Twitter page is. I'm sure it is filled with with the nicest things to say about trans people. I'm sure there is no. Oh shit! He's right here. Arthur Shaper. Oh fuck! He lives in Florida. No. <laughs> I assume because of all his the shit he's saying about DeSantis. Oh fuck, bro! All right, what's his Twitter? I want to look at his Twitter. Is this him? Yep. Oh, fuck. Child of God, Christ first, America only. Fuck you. He's a writer for Canada Free Press. I thought America only, bro. I just want to see what he's saying on Twitter. He just reposts a lot of shit. There ain't no way. Oh my god, dude is such a fucking joke. My third child came out. I'll tag him when I post a video about dunking on the Sweden study. I'll make sure to tag his ass. But at 11 and told us that he was a boy. He was assigned female at birth. And so he socially transitioned, obviously, because he was only 11. Uh, he is now an 18-year-old college university student and thriving. Um, and then my uh, youngest child came out as a trans girl at the age of 15. So um, I live this with my children. Um, I made the trek to the emergency room with suicide, um, a suicide attempt and a suicide plan with each of my children. Did at any point did your opinion he ain't got on shit this to say. Look at him, look at him stewing, because there's nothing he can say to this, right? His whole claim, well, they, they, the suicide's worse, but these are people living the situation going, no, it's not. Does the gender dysphoria or, or a mental illness change as you know, you've had actual kids that has transitioned? My opinion hasn't changed. It's a mental health condition, but antidepressants weren't working. We, before uh, Mitchell came out, we tried everything we'd been to every single therapist and nothing was touching it until we used he him pronouns and that was all it took to make things better for him initially and then we did the medical transition you know i don't even know where to start here it's like sex again sex is not assigned at birth it's established That's, at you're conception not, we you're have not to get addressing the here. anything yeah. she fucking said you fucking joke you're not addressing a single word that she said and the second thing is we're seeing like this move. I mean, you were mentioning the academic setting. Notice how the, the academic terms are changing, but this is a result of pressure. This is a result of societal pressure. Prove that, prove that, prove that, prove that. That's a, that's a claim that's so hard to prove. You have to prove that it's, that it's what's act. First of all, what's actually happening is the academic literature changes. Then we as a society start changing the way we refer to things. It's not the other way around. It's not, we as a society change. So we force academia into it. We don't, we can't force academia into anything. But that's what happened with homosexuality, by the way. Homosexuality is recognized as unhealthy behaviors. Now, whether you call it a mental illness or uh, a deviant behavior or destructive behavior, that's a, that's a point of debate. It's an unhealthy behavior for sure, and certainly it's the case with transgenderism, somebody Yo, cutting off healthy Julie, body parts. We have crazy. seen numerous detransitioners now coming forward. They had severe health and mental problems, like the ones that you've talked about. But we find, we find that, psych I have a friend, Kevin, Kevin Witt. He's an outspoken activist. He's been on, been on commercials to protect children from sex mutilation. He was abused as a kid. He was, he was beaten by his dad. He was molested by older kids when he was in school. He struggled with identity issues. These are horrific traumas that he endured and not once okay. did a counselor ever address those deeper issues. That's Nothing to do with what she said. You ignored everything that that woman said, everything. And then tried to try to you uh, tried to tokenize some a friend with an identity shit you have to try to make a point. That, Fuck. needs to be happening. Now let's actually He's hear from the undecided group. This. So undecided group, which side do you resonate with more? So 
Why did you choose Ugh. the liberal side? I do think it's a mental health condition. I, I don't like calling it an illness. Everyone has things they don't like about their bodies. I don't think we're calling everyone mentally ill. It's interesting how you brought up conception. I think what Jubilee needs to do, because here's the issue. Jubilee is taking this, uh, I won't say it's a centrist stance, but this hands-off approach. And it's dangerous not to call out the blatant misinformation that's being spread here. Jubilee's just not doing it. The man blatantly lied about multiple things and Jubilee's just, ah, well, that's the show. No, dude. Call out the fact that he's lying about stuff. And saying that gender is society at conception because... Sex is the term. That's what I said, not gender. I said sex. Sex, sorry. Sex is society at okay, conception. Okay, then your whole, your whole purpose is fucking... You just proved yourself wrong. If you're going to sit here and go, no, 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 I didn't say gender was assigned to birth. It's sex did. Great. We're not talking about sex. We're talking about gender. My voice is getting really high because I'm annoyed. Because established. Established. Okay. It's someone very close to me is trying. He's me. Established. Established. Okay. It's someone very close to me is trans, and so hearing it from people who identify as trans themselves, you can talk about statistics and facts all day, but. If you actually listen to people and what they're going through and their experience, I feel like it's just much deeper. You were on the undecided in the previous prompt, but now it seems like you went on the conservative side. What changed and what arguments spoke to you most? To my knowledge, the American Psychological Association still categorizes gender dysphoria as a mental illness. Uh... Let's pull it up. So when, are the, when you go to the American Psychological Association or what they call, what they consider gender, gender dysphoria, nowhere on here, let's control F, mental ill. Oh my God, mental illness? It's not here. But disorders? It's in the diagnostic manual for a disorder. Not for a mental illness. Okay. Okay. They're different. So that was wrong. So just to stay on the side of facts, um, and at this time, what the experts are categorizing as, I'm going to obviously side with that side. That's I not feel like what the experts are categorizing it as. Like science is always changing its definitions, oh, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we yeah. used to drill heads and sides to fix migraines. Um, I'm curious if <sighs> that will change your mind if that classification was taken away. Well, to my knowledge, I think the American Psychological Association does intend to uh, later categorize it under neurodivergence rather than mental like illness, but it's also something that needs to be treated. It's kind of grains as a disorder. When people with gender dysphoria go into um, get the diagnosis. In fact, let's see, what's the distinction between a, a mental disorder and a mental illness? Now, this thing, mental disorders are an outdated term. I don't know that I agree with that because they still use it constantly. This isn't telling me why the two things are used differently. Either way, not a mental illness. 
they do have to go. I have an eating illness. <laughs> That's crazy. To a psychologist and get um, a prescription and this sort of stuff. So it's part of the process. So just, I understand that science is constantly an evolving field of study, but as to what we know now, I think I'd rather just stay safe and stay with the, with, with the vaccine. Do you feel like if they are to medically transition that they need to go through a series or rounds of different psychiatric tests? Well, in the, in, um, in the case of children, I think that would be necessary just because this is, I know in some cases it can be reversible, but this is a life-changing decision. So you brought up the word life-changing, right? Mm -hmm. I'm curious if there's any question that you'd like to ask either side, because that seems to be the big stipulation in this kind of debate here. Um, well, I guess I would like to ask the liberals, did you see in your own lives, like vast improvements? Like what did that look like, the vast improvements that you saw? Uh, my mental health was just largely improved. I was having a much easier time, I guess, making friends because I was more confident in my own identity. My children's lives changed completely. It was like turning on a light switch. They brightened, they were more social. They uh, excelled in school again after failing. Um, they just completely transformed their lives. Yeah, that's very interesting. You were on the conservative side and now you're back on the undecided. You guys flip-flopped here. What's something that kind of brought you back into the middle here? Yeah, I would say, I guess, my main reason for being here is that I just am unclear as to, like, I guess the difference between something being a mental illness or mental condition. I, I know some people in the conversation said that they use them interchangeably. Some people said that they prefer to use the term mental condition rather than illness. Um, you know, I guess what kind of differentiates those things, if anything? Well, I think you just hit the nail on the head there. Changing the name of something doesn't doesn't change the fundamental reality that it, it, there's, a, there's a problem, there's a mental health issue that the person has. It's a disorder, it's a, it's a break from reality. That's just a fact. Okay, the person is born male or reality, female and thinks that they fuck. should be something else. Now, regardless of how that one treats that, the fact is, and I, I would submit even from the, the comments from the liberal side, they recognize that it's an illness that needs to be treated. I recognize that the, it needs treating, but it's not a break from reality. That's yes, a psychosis. Is. A psychosis A psychosis is a break from reality. Which is a mental illness. Gender dysphoria is not a psychosis. <laughs> but it is a break from Wait, reality. No, you're, this is so, Arthur, you're so stupid. You, yeah, you're literally saying all mental illnesses are psychosis? No. Fuck, bro. Reality because the person thinks they should be something else. I think it's pretty clear. It's a disconnect between reality. You've, you're born male, you're born female, but then your brain is saying something else. The cool thing about this entire debate is that liberals for once agree that there's possibly a soul, right? They say, you know, I was born male or female, but something deep soul. down, something in no, me. No, this is, is nothing to do with the soul. Mental, mental, oh, I'm sorry, not mental. Gender identity is in our brain mapping. Our brain structures itself to have these sort of things. It's not a soul, it's the brain. <laughs> Fuck. I'm actually this, hey, I'm actually this. Bro. The reality is what is physical. And so if you are physically or biologically male or female, you don't need to change your body, you need to change what you're thinking. Okay, let's go back to the undecided. Yeah. Did that help clarify or is there any additional questions that bring up? Um, I guess it kind of did. You know, when I think of like a mental illness, it is something that like we treat. And so I guess in that regard, I would, I don't know if it's necessarily a position. I mean, I feel like, you know, we do talk about, you know, people who are diagnosed with gender dysphoria, like you treat that with some, I think in many cases, I don't know if it's all the time, I'm sure it's not all the time, but in the majority of the cases, you treat that with some kind of transition, whether it's a medical or a social or both. And so, I mean, I see kind of that definition. I feel like, but I mean, my takeaway Bro, is that I feel like I they both kind of Arthur, agree with that. And I don't so know necessarily that. Dumb. I think it's a politically charged definition. I think it's like obviously how you interpret it and like what is treatment, what is proper treatment, you know, what is included within an, a mental illness, what isn't. But I guess my takeaway I think is like, I think we, or at least the conversation, the people in the conversation, I think they agree a lot more on kind of the general topic itself than maybe they might realize. Um, but of course, when you get to nitty gritty, I think there's, that's where you get the division. The medical community is pushing gender transitions for financial gain. So I disagree. Um, I mean, when I was started, started going through my process of transitioning, I didn't feel pushed by any medical professional at all. There were, in fact, quite the opposite, a lot of hurdles and just like bureaucratic red tape sections I had to like work through. But it's, it's not something that I think, in my experience, was pushed onto me at least. Yeah, I completely agree with that. When I started my transition, it took over a year just for me to get to my third doctor's appointment for us to actually like talk and evaluate things. And as far as cost goes, my insurance covered everything. But they're, they're, they are still getting paid. 
just the government or somebody else is paying them. I mean, in comparison to a BBL, yeah, like yeah. Well, yeah. So, so here, but yeah, but they're still getting paid and they're still getting financial. I actually think there's three different types of doctors. I think that there are people that are going out there and doing it for financial gain. We saw it in Vanderbilt. We saw it in so many other instances where they are doing it. We also see that they are manipulating the system. That's why we have a lot of detransitioners right now, and, and that's why we're seeing that, that, gr that community grow, is because they're manipulating patients, they're mis manipulating parents. We're not seeing that and so this, the other, grow, by the, the way. third is, the I don't know if it's ineptitude consistent. or if it's um, incompetence or laziness, but I think that there is a section, there's a, there's a group of mental health providers who simply right now we want to cure everything with a pill. Notice so, how at no point she said there's a group that's just trying to help their patients. Notice how that's not one of the people that this, a person who transitioned, believes exists. Oh, we see this not only in the trans community, but we see this in the SSRI community. We see this, everybody's being put onto something and we're not really treating the root causes. It's one of the reasons why we're seeing a high comorbidity of like autism in the community. A lot of people that have autism are getting sucked into this and they're not being treated for the autism, they're treating for gender dysphoria. How do you treat autism? What would be the uh, treatment plan for autism? I would just like to know. So one thing to uh, consider, and I did research on this, is that apparently based of, on top or bottom surgeries, it can actually range from around ten to $25,000 uh, from male to female transitions to female to male transitions. And I think you know, what both sides can probably agree on is that America is a for-profit healthcare industry, right? right? We don't have universal healthcare. Yeah, and, and anything to consider there. So, so yep. with the oh, with socialized the, medicine, with with the Vanderbilt situation, she actually said because of Obamacare, they have to pay for it, and so they they are forcing mm -hmm. insurance companies to pay for it. So it became a big money maker. Was her specific phrase that she said? I just want to remind everyone that there are international standards of care, and there are many countries out there that have social medicine, and it's not all for profit. Argentina and Denmark apparently are one of the two countries that has included, I believe, transitioning for minors in their private and public health care plans. I, I'd but, like to comment, but I want to give you a chance first. Um, no, it's, it's kind of hard to draw intentions completely um, with these kinds of things. I, I completely agree with you that America is a for-profit uh, country, and so regardless of what trend or what surgery is getting popular, they're going to find a way to make money out of it. Yeah, America is a for-profit and everything, but an EpiPen costs a whole lot more than testosterone does, so even with that, and we're, uh, once again, the push that is for true. being trans in medical societies, as far as our experience go goes, doesn't really exist because two people here are saying that, you know, it was quite the opposite. It took significantly longer for anything to happen, significantly longer to try to do anything, significantly longer than, you know, as far as like cosmetic surgeries or anything like that goes. So. I, I, I need to, I need, I need to point out, Big Pharma makes big money off of butchering little boys and girls. There is big money to be made in this. Follow All the money. Ted Hidako, he's a father who's been fighting very hard because he's in a fraught divorce. His son was being put through the transitions. He saw in his medical bills $200,000 for the chemical treatments alone. We could talk about the Jeff Younger situation. Jeff is trying to fight to save his son. Now his ex-wife has taken the son here to transition him to try to become a girl, not only are the medical costs being put upon him, but also legal costs. So to your point though, so what we saw out of the whistleblower I'm glad everybody ignored Louis, him, was so stupid. Is a self-identified queer woman who's married to a trans man, and she blew the whistle on what's going on there. Now where I hear a lot of adults um, in this situation say that it was a long process for you, um, that's not what we're hearing from detransitioners and a lot of these patients, and that's not what the St. Louis whistleblower said. She said they were basically pencil whipping um, uh, psychologist psychologist letters so that they could start Myers on transition, and that's one of the reasons why I think that that clinic is also closing. I mean, once again, for me, it's I'm always going to go on personal experience before I go on stats because there are too many trans people specifically who don't get accounted into those statistics. So it's hard for me to be like, yes, this number, and yes, this number. I'm, yeah. you know, whatever, but for me, it's like, it took a year and a half of therapy for me and my therapist, who was also trans, to go through that process and write that out for me yeah. to be comfortable or me to be, you know, whatever it may be. Um, to I would, I would, I would, people who detransition were never trans to begin with. I don't know that I would necessarily say that. Um, if we want to look at people who detransition and stay detransitioned, then yeah, it's very clear that they aren't 
um, trans or they don't find, even if they are trans, they don't find, they didn't, they may, might not have had a severe gender dysphoria as they thought. But the bulk of people who detransition do it because of financial reasons or uh, societal or family pressure. That's why the bulk, that's why bulk, uh, the bulk of people detransition. And then typically when they're out of those situations, they will transition back. Get what I needed. So on top of that, the money situation, there's so many trans people who can't afford to transition, whether they're on insurance or not. So for me, other to, people are paying for it. What so other the government, people? Medicare, Medicaid. My goodness, right. this was well, a discussion in Wyoming. Let's stop it here, here and we'll ask the yes, undecided group. Okay, undecided group, let's hear about which side that you resonate with more, liberals or conservative. Conservatives got dunked on. You started off in the undecided, then conservative, and now the liberal. Yeah. You've been all across the spectrum. Yeah, all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> let's hear about. Well, let's find out. Just Medicare or Medicaid? Well, Medicare. What would be the point? Medicare is for 65 and up. Does Medicaid cover gender affirming care? Thank you, Boo. Update on Medicaid coverage of gender affirming health services. Transgender not married adults often face challenges and barriers. Blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Um, so it looks like they m did as of Biden. Okay, here we go. Gender from hormone drugs, including estrogen, antiandrogens, and progest uh, progestins, as well as testosterone and other agents. Under federal law, subject to exceptions for a few drug class, states Medicaid programs are required to cover all drugs for manufacturers that have entered into a rebate agreement with the Secretary of Health. Uh, 12, 25 states reported covering gender from hormones, and 10 of these states require prior authorization. So only, only half of the states in the country cover them. Yeah, so in conclusion, it's state by state. So he lied about that. What kind of resonated Again. with you more to switch sides this time? I'm sure and confident that there are practitioners out there who are pushing people to transition, who are just signing off on prescriptions. Because yes, I mean, you know, like the points were made that there is money to be made, of course. But I don't know that I'd go as far as to say, you know, that there is this, like, I think someone mentioned it on the liberal side that there's like a conspiracy going on. I don't mm. think that's the case. I think, again, there are absolutely predatory, you know, practitioners and maybe even large organizations who are looking to profit off of, you know, the medical transitioning process. Um, but, you know, I think someone mentioned, you know, the aspect of personal experiences and how for many trans people, it's extremely expensive. And even if you are on some kind of insurance or even if you are on some kind of plan, it can still, you know, the cost can, you know, mount up a lot. Yeah, that's interesting too, because I guess in any movement, right, there are gonna be people that take advantage about it for their own selfish gains. Mm -hmm. How much money is, I guess, there to be made in so the transition that's, 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 Honestly, that's a hard Parker question to, to answer, this. right? Be because so you're funny. creating a medical patient for life. Mm -hmm. So it's over the course of a person's lifetime that they would be buying hormones and all this. You're, it's not accurate. It's, you have to take hormones. Trans person they, they have to take, let's, 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 let's let her speak. Let's let her speak. No, let's let her speak. Well, let's let her speak. Yeah, that's in, that's let's let her speak. So, so, so you're right. I mean, Damn. there are a lot of people that may come off. It's not. It's more so on the uh, trans man side than the trans woman side, where you have to be on hormones forever, otherwise it comes back. And if you have your sex, if you have your primary sex organs removed as well, um, so that's that's kind of a hard question to answer. What it is over the course of a lifetime, I think they've estimated up to a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand. But like one surgery, so like a vaginoplasty cost about thirty. Twenty to twenty to thirty thousand um, dollars. I think the uh, the phalloplasty costs more, um, and then you get, Actually, go down a little about bit it, with I could uh, never be on this show because I'm like not a liberal, and I don't ever want them to class thousands of dollars. Or, you know, at least I mean, a breast augmentation is about ten thousand dollars. I've had children have surgeries and medication for various illnesses, and I always find the way to pay for it. And I found the way to pay for what needed in this case. How much did it cost? What was the general range? I'm not comfortable sharing that. Okay. Um, I can say that for me, I, I pay about like $10 every like four months for my medication. And yeah, that's pretty much it. 
So you've been kind of consistent throughout in each of these prompts of staying on the liberal side. Yeah. Is there anything that you might want to ask that may potentially maybe even sway you to the other side or just something maybe that you're not considering? My cousin is trans and he is so important to me. And so saying that it's, it's a mental illness, saying that it's pushing when you can see that so many trans people of color are being denied treatment. I just, I don't think that that's, that's fair a big, to say that that's, it's pushing. So, so a big, a, like another big thing we have to look at, right, is like, let's look at the numbers. Again, go into my handy dandy source document. Go into gender affirming care. Number of children who receive gender affirming care. As of 2021, right, as of 2021, four, 42,167 kids were diagnosed with gender dysphoria, okay? And if we're looking at the kids who, are, who receive puberty blockers, for instance, that's only about 1,390 in that year, if we look at hormone therapy, it's only about 4,231. And then top surgery is only about 282. So it would just seem to me, if the idea is to push this thing, right? If the idea is these doctors are pushing, pushing, pushing so they can get all this money and the health companies get all this money and Big Pharma can get all this money, it doesn't seem like they're getting a bunch of money. Uh, a, a, a thousand kids getting puberty blockers, it's not a lot. 4,231 kids getting hormone therapy, it's not a lot. So how is it being pushed? And the reason I'm only bringing up the youth is because I don't think you can claim it's being pushed on adults because they're adults. It would, I would be disrespecting someone very close to me if I was over there and saying that it's a mental illness and then they're pushing transitioning just so they can make money. Okay, so you're back on the undecided. What, what made you stay here? It's a bit dangerous to generalize or demonize the medical community and state that there's like a wide contingent or conspiracy trying to push um, transitioning, especially if we don't have evidence of it. I think there's probably, like um, he was saying, evidence of predatory practitioners and that sort of thing. If it brings them sort of some sort of financial benefit, we do have to question whether their motives are entirely pure, but that could be true of like any disease. So it's, it's kind of both sides, I think, had good points and both um, were kind of right. So I'm, I'm not in the middle because I can't make a decision. I'm more in the middle because I agree with them both. Schools should include trans conversation in sex ed. And I mean, age-appropriate time, I agree, yes. Yeah, sure. What is that age-appropriate? I think by grades three or four, they understand. So because what is that, like around eight, nine, or? I don't know anymore. <laughs> My kids are too old. But that sounds about right. I think eight or nine years old is a good time because gender is a concept that is formed in the mind of a child around the ages of two, three, or four years old. By the time they're seven or eight, they understand the permanency of gender. So I think that's a good time She's to smart. introduce it. Now, should they be talked about as just as much as, let's say, heterosexual sex, or sh more in, in terms of including different historical relevance? What do you mean by that? What, what is that question asking? I don't understand what he's asking. See anything like Why are you I think it would be great to introduce the difference between gender people. expression, gender identity, and sexual orientation because that is three completely different realms. And children can understand the difference between gender expression and gender identity at that age without ever having to talk about sex. I agree. Yeah, I definitely disagree. Um, I think, especially what they're proposing right now, do. a lot of the mainstream sort of education on sex ed is pretty like vulgar looking at a couple like books, you see a lot of parents going out to like city committee meetings and they're reading books in front of like the school committee and the school has to like stop the, the, in, the entire thing because they're reading such vulgar stuff. You want me to read the parts in the Bible where it talks about rape? I'm sorry, grape? Should we do that, homie? But I bet you'd love the Bible to stay in schools. I bet, I bet. If I had to push back on that yeah. though, kind of we've been going through like different personal experiences and some of these cases we might just be hearing about because they're the most extremist of cases. Sure. Do you think that's what's going on or do you think it's more of a common prevalent uh, instance that's happening around the country? Um, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a differentiation between personal experiences and just what's going on in general. And so of course you're going to see like the more popular cases on social media and stuff, but what it really I love, I love that he was pushed on it and instantly started faltering. He was pushed on it and just instantly, instantly started backtracking. Immediately started backtracking. Down to the question isn't really so much what's the content, but is it true? And it's not true. 
And so why should kids be learning about it? I mean, personally, I think that sex education should be simple biology, and then anything above that should be an opt-in system to where parents have to opt their children into that, into those, into that learning. I, I really don't think it's the responsibility of teachers to be talking to children about that. I think it really boils down to it is a parental's right to the issue, and parents make the ultimate decision how their children learn. So education is a parental rights issue, but healthcare isn't. Healthcare, no, we get to determine whether or not people's kids have healthcare. But, okay, just wanted to make sure I, I understood that. Earn that. Um, I, I disagree only because, like, where I'm from North Carolina, and there was a point where sex ed wasn't being taught, and then there was a point where it was. And when it, they started teaching sex ed, there were children that were coming forward about, like, being touched inappropriate and things like that because they didn't know that those things were inappropriate parts because they hadn't been taught otherwise. So, not teaching children about their bodies, about their sex, about their gender, about their expression, you're eliminating them. Hey, you're you're the, giving the people, pedophiles specifically, the opportunity to to prey on them because they don't know any better. You're leaving yeah. them in the dark. I as just far as like gender so. is concerned, like being trans, had I learned about what trans was at an early age, I think I had a, would have had a very, a much happier life in general. Yeah. By 21, I was going into transitioning and everything like that, but I felt and knew that there was something specifically yeah. different yeah. by the age of like six, six, yeah. seven, without even knowing what trans was. Yeah. And had I been taught that, transitioning later on in life would have been completely different. Yeah, and like I said, at the, I think it was the very first prompt we had. I think almost every transsexual I know had that early experience, right? That's mm -hmm. happy in their transition. So I, I agree in that. I just, I, I really think it is the parental's, it, it's parents' responsibility. The schools are supposed to pick up where the parents fall off. That's the whole point of sending your children to school. Know your parents have the right to make the decision I, for you. Okay. I, I <laughs> just want to interject right there, and that is a very U.S. way of thinking, is that parent, parental rights trump everything else, because there's a convention of children's rights worldwide, and the U.S. is the only country who hasn't signed on to it. So children in other countries have rights before their parents do. And I think that it should be taught in schools to protect the child, not just so that the parent gets to be, make all the rules. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the other side of the group. Which side do you guys resonate yeah. with more, liberals or conservatives? I think we have all undecided here. Uh, let's start with you, um, because this is interesting, because you've always been on the liberal side until now. Mm -hmm. What spoke to you that made you undecided in this instance? Well, I would just like to mention that I actually work in childcare and I work with children. Mm. And so, um, as much as I think that we should have comprehensive um, sex education, I think that five years old is a bit young. Um, I think maybe I like middle somebody, school age, somebody like somebody in the TikTok said schools for academics. Period. High school. You know, we I have a class called that, social studies. Um, where we parents study should have societies. completely all the say, mm -hmm. because if that parent is social um, things more on one side or the other, then they are going to push their child to do what they want them to do, and that child should be able to make that decision for themselves once they are at that age. Maybe both sides actually Yeah, so this is my whole thing. Them. First of all, first of all, if you as a parent aren't aware of what your kids are being taught, that's on you, first of all. Curriculums are provided ahead of time. You get a syllabus. You know what your, your teacher is going to go over with your kids. Second of all, if you look at the actual plans for what you should, what like federally, what we believe kids should understand of, about sex education at what age, at no point is any of these things um, like... Peer, like none of them are things that people would disagree with if they actually want kids to be protected and they want kids to be safe. And the final thing I'll say is, uh, sexual assault happens in the home, predominantly in the home or uh, by people your um, people your close friends with. Like that's where the most amount of sexual assault happens. So it's not surprising to me that there are going to be some parents that don't want their kids to learn sex ed, because why would they? Why would they, right? Because they don't want their kids to have advocates. School should be a place where your where your child has an advocate outside of you. So, you know the fact that trans individuals exist. However, more of the discrepancy is around the age and what when it's being introduced. What yes. do you think? Yes, I, I think she mentioned around eight or nine. I think that's a good age. I have a little brother who's 11, and when he was around that age, 
he was able to understand that I was queer and that my cousin was trans, and he was able to understand I think the that we were. Comprehensive sexual health education. We were different. Uh, I would say around eight or nine is is grade. probably fine in my opinion because that's generally the age in which children have a solid grasp on their own identity, and um, it's usually you know about ten years after that maybe that they on average will disclose that. But at that age is when kids will usually figure out that they're not cis, if that's the case. Um, this lady, she started, they started out with this concept of permanency. I just thought that was so profound, undergirding the point that I've been making from the outset, that sex, if you want to call it gender, is there's a permanency about it that needs to be respected. And when you're teaching little kids about transgenderism, you're automatically injecting confusion. That feeds to the very contagion that we were taught. Holy fuck, no you're not. Kids understand. You just go, that's a woman. They go, okay, cool. And then they move on. And then they move on. They move on with their day. Some women were weren't born. Some women were born uh, were born boys and then became women later on. Okay, cool, great, easy. And then they move on. Talking about at the outset, it breeds this confusion into children. Um, that's a real problem. I agree with the point that was made here. Um, I don't think that sex should really be pushed onto kids at all. I mean, for hundreds of years, public education didn't teach sex ed, and things went pretty well. For hundreds of years, public education didn't teach sex ed and things went well. So we're not going to talk about the fact that husbands just used to habitually rape their spouses. Like, that wasn't a thing. We're not going to talk about the fact that, like, women used to just be straight up sold. We're not going to talk about the fact that, like, purity culture saw a rise in teen pregnancy. We're not going to talk about any of these things. We're not going to mention the fact that, that when, when it came to not teaching sex education, how many kids were assaulted in churches. We're not going to talk about any of these things. The, thank you, Malcolm, the AIDS pandemic. We're not going to talk about any of these things that were bred from a lack of comprehensive sexual health education. Homie, the hairline's gone because it ran away because there wasn't a single thought in your head. Well, you didn't have all this confusion. And regarding the situation about pedophilia or otherwise, you don't need to teach a children about children about transgenderism for them to know that somebody shouldn't be touching your private parts. Did that help clarify your point? Um, no. You know, it did. I think, you know, my takeaway, I guess, you know, I would say I still kind of am unsure where I would stand specifically, like in terms of age ranges and, you know, content. But I think, you know, for me, I think there is kind of, for me, I'd, the center of it is that conflict between, ball, you know, parents that don't want specific things to, to be talked about and then parents who just don't care at all. But at least knowing that the conversation's going on and maybe signing off on that. I know we've seen that in the past with, you know, like taking the slips home and being, you know, showing the parent if they, you know, like, we're going to take the kids into classes today and we're going to talk about this, you know, sign off if you want them to or not. However, wouldn't that kind of introduce a bit, introduce a bit of a slippery slope? What if that happens when it comes to discussions around history, around race? Do you think that could lead to parents kind of essentially shaping the worldview that may not be factually accurate? You know, when you start talking about, I guess, you know, teaching about like sex ed and let's say gender expression, sexual orientation, I think you do walk a different line between like, you know, bringing up points of history or, you know, even like the sciences. I mean, everything, you know, what you include in a curriculum, whether it's science, factual, even mathematics, like there's some kind of, you know, political basis there, whether it's super political or super apolitical. I mean, there's always going to be interest there. And so I think what's really important is, you know, curriculum transparency with parents. I think parents and students should be involved in the development of that process so that everyone at least has a say or at least can see what's being talked about at the table. You really have bounced around everywhere. So I'm curious if you wanted to ask like any specific things. Or Part of my issue, I think, with the idea of like having it mandatory at certain ages um, is that some kids, and this is why I do think parents should have the right to pull their kids out. Bro, here's what I'm gonna say. If you're a parent and you're upset because you think you don't have a say in your child's education, go to a fucking PTA meeting. Go to a fucking school board meeting. That's where these things are talked about. They're out in the open. You are just not trying hard enough as a parent. Like, it literally is just, uh, it's just you're lazy. I'm going to say it right now. You're a lazy parent, and now you're upset that they're teaching something you're going to be like, this was never talked about. Yes, it was. I, every curriculum change is talked about at fucking school board meetings. Every single, everything that ha that goes on in schools is talked about at school board meetings. You know how I know that? Because I've worked in a school and I've sat in at school board meetings. <laughs> they are the most boring procedural shit, but everything going on in that school is talked about. Every time they hire a new, a new staff member, it goes through the school board. Every time they make the slightest change to something, it goes through the goddamn school board.
like the really involved parents do know what their kids are ready for and what they aren't. Some kids are not quite ready for those conversations. I think one thing that I heard that was a little concerning to me on the liberal side and kind of kept me here was I did hear someone, I think, say something about a parents of other cultures not being willing to. And I, I, I've lived in five countries. Mm. I've lived in two Muslim majority countries. I've lived in a Hindu, technically should be secular, but Hindu majority country. And I've lived in a Catholic country. And I think the Western mindset and how we approach issues, and we have to understand, like, when you're coming out of the country and you're bringing your children into a new culture as an immigrant, you want to keep your values at home, right? And, and there's things that you're going to be concerned about and nervous about, partially because of, like, religious affiliation, maybe, or just not experiencing it. And so if schools want those conversations to happen, the focus needs to not be going directly to the children, yeah, but it needs to be going to the parents. Hey, it needs to be thank you, prioritizing legs, assimilating the parents into the so culture much, so they you. are aware how to have the conversations with their kids at home. Because what ultimately happens is if the child is learning something at school and they feel like they can't go home to their parents and the parents find out about it in a way that's not, you know, congruent or whatever, this creates a, like a distrust from those parents with the school system. And, you know, I mean, that, that just brings chaos to America. That's, that's a very serious issue. Do you think this is a uniquely American problem? I think it's a Western viewpoint problem. Minors are capable of making life-altering decisions. Yeah, absolutely disagree. There's no way. Uh, minors aren't able to make decisions whether to join the military, uh, get married, or make tattoos. And so when you're talking about something that's super important, like uh, sex, gender, whatever you want to call it, um, there's no reason neither, we should be chopping up kids, putting up... Neither of those things, not getting married, not joining the military, not getting a tattoo, none of those things are is identity-based. None of it's identity-based. Um... So, yeah, it's not identity based. A bunch of hormones in them that are super dangerous that we don't have, we don't quite know the effects of and then completely change. Wait, them. Are they so I hate when people do this. Are they super dangerous or do we not know the effects of them? Which one is it? It can't be both. It can't be super dangerous, but we don't know the effects. If we don't know the effects, we don't know if they're dangerous. In the life. That's what I'm like really passionate about, especially just, I think this is like the voice, just this is the sentiment among like a lot of Americans is, you can do what you want, but why mess with the kids? And so that's where kind of I'm at. It's like, why mess with the kids? For the purposes of this discussion, we're defining minors as under 18. When you say that we don't know the effects of these chemicals and these drugs and all that, it's worth mentioning that generally speaking, all these medicines that are used were first introduced to be used to treat cis people for various things. Um, Joe Rogan, for example, takes TRT, very similar drug to what trans men take. Um, estradiol is used to treat menopause sometimes. There are people who take uh, spironolactone, which is some taken by trans femmes. People take that same drug to treat blood pressure. Yeah, but when we're talking about minors specifically, um, it's an issue because I don't, I don't think that they have the cognitive ability to consent to long-term decisions, especially when we start to see... Just by the way, these same people, if a minor gets pregnant, will say they have to carry out the pregnancy because they don't actually care about whether they are cognitive enough to make these decisions. That's not what they care about. They just don't like trans people. Like we talked about, we can talk about studies, like studies show that 90% wound up desisting by the age of 20. Desisting? Oh my God, I can't believe I have to do this. Desisting does not mean what you think it means, okay? Desisting means that they had some gender dysphoria, but it wasn't like full-blown gender dysphoria. They didn't have long-term persistent gender dysphoria. Desisting just means, oh, I had a little bit of gender dysphoria here, but I grew out of it, all right? There's a difference between desisting and detransitioning. Detransitioning is when we're looking at people who had a marketed long-term experience with gender dysphoria, that they then went on gender-affirming. Desister, people who desist usually never go on gender-affirming healthcare because they've desisted. So this, I, this use of the word desisting is very frustrating when I hear people on the conservative side use it because it seems they don't know what desisting actually means. We know what puberty blockers, like puberty blockers, for example, what they do for precocious puberty, but they've never been studied and they're not FDA approved. They're prescribed off label for, for people in key growth years in adolescence. And so we're starting to see even Marcy Bowers talked about starting somebody on puberty blockers and then going straight to cross-sex hormones and every time they're never able to fully you know, achieve orgasm as an adult. Every single person that she's ever had and she's the president of WPATH. You have to do the studies, you have to figure out. Isn't it crazy that 
there are people that exist that have been using HRT since they were kids and can have sex and experience sexual arousal. Arousal, isn't that crazy? First of all, we yes, we use multiple drugs off label. That's just a thing that happens. Second of all, even if the FD, for, uh, two things about conservatives, they love to quote the FDA when it suits them. So usually in a debate with conservatives, like, let's go, okay, so FDA approved stuff is good, so the vaccine would be good. They'd be like, well, no, 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 you can't trust the FDA, blah, blah, blah. But now it's, well, we need to trust the FDA. It's so flip-floppy. But the biggest thing that I want to I talk about here is that the use of gender-affirming healthcare, so specifically like uh, pubertal suppressants and HRT. Um, pubertal, let's talk pubertal suppressants to begin with because that's what she brought up. Pubertal pers- uh Pubertal suppressants being off-label doesn't do anything because the use of pubertal suppressants is still being used the same. You're not taking the drug to cause some other... So, for instance, let's take Viagra. So, when Viagra was introduced, it wasn't a a pee-pee sweller. It was used as a blood clotter, I think is what it was originally used for, for like heart stuff, but they found out that it worked better for this thing, so they switched. They're not saying, hey, take this drug that's meant to clot your blood and it'll make your pee-pee stand up. They're saying, hey, this is a drug used for pubertal suppression. You're using it for pubertal suppression. So just because a trans kid is using it for pubertal suppression versus a cis kid who's using it for pubertal suppression doesn't mean it's not going to still do the exact same thing, which is pubertal suppression. Out, and you have to put a pause button on it. Otherwise, what we're doing is literally experimenting on children. So one thing that's also important to consider, too, is that currently there are laws, right, when it comes to voting, uh, you know, drinking alcohol, even buying cigarettes at this point, right? I think that is something to consider in terms of this debate. We don't hold someone's hand when we go in to vote. We go in and vote on our own. When a child who is 16 makes a medical decision to transition, it is made with a team. There's parents, there's psychologists, there's endocrinologists. It's not just one child walking in all by themselves to do it by themselves. We trust children to prepare our food for us at fast food restaurants. We trust children to drive combines on farmland in all 50 states. Why can't we trust a child to Damn, tell us that they are that. not comfortable she hit with and that, that we need to treat them medically Let's with go, a medical baby. transition? Because those are practices. Those are jobs that, that aren't going to affect their lives forever. So that's not even, I mean, you can, but that comparison just forever. isn't going to work at all. You that's can the have first a thing. farm accident. Getting back, to the, getting back to this main question. Let's children go. Cannot- See, and he's going to skate over it. She's right. You could have an accident in both of those jobs that affect your life forever. It absolutely could affect your life forever not commit to these life-altering decisions. They don't even know what life they can have. There are so many options that are available to, available to them and they get cut short. You're making statements about how they have all these adults guiding them into this. That's the whole point. They're guiding them into getting their bodies mutilated when they should be dealing with the mental health issues. Wallace Wong is an unscrupulous medical professional in British Columbia and he is part of the whole profit regime, they are rushing kids into these procedures. I know this because a father found out that his daughter was being transitioned shit, without, his knowledge or, without knowledge or permission. And when he was telling the public about it, he went to jail. That's what Canada does. No, so it's not shut just the about fuck up. This. That's not what happened. Holy shit, this dude just lies. He just lies. It's so funny. So we can actually pull this up. So it's like it's the dad in Canada who was jailed. Now, what they're going to say is they're going to say he was jailed for misgendering his kid. Right. That's what they. So here here's the Daily Wire. Right. A Canadian father who was thrown in jail after misgendering his gender confused teenage daughter has scored a legal win in the British Club. He's this is his his claim now. Right. Oh, well, I was thrown in jail for misgendering my child. That's not what he did. He literally repeatedly violated a court order. So, a British Columbia father who who objects to his teenage oh, turn turn you off who objects to his teenage child's gender transition therapy was arrested on Tuesday and put in jail until at least Friday for repeatedly speaking publicly about aspects of the case which he was under court order not to do. 
court order not to do. The father, known as CD, has been charged with criminal contempt for allegedly violating court orders. He's being held in custody until a bail healing on Friday. The criminal charge is one that, if found guilty, because he can spend as much five years behind bars, case stems from CD's battle to prevent his child, AB, as the, uh, as the child is known, from receiving gender transition hormone therapy. But what began as a family court dispute has now wound up in criminal charges due to allegations that CD is persistent in violating court orders. The orders instruct him to not make public any information that would identify AB or the medical professionals involved to call AB by the child's preferred name and gender pronoun and to not share his opinions of the case publicly. The British Columbia Court of Appeal laid out the court order CD was to abide by in January 2020. Since then, the BC Prosecution Service alleges he failed to do so on multiple occasions. In June 2020, CD gave an interview to a YouTube channel where he alleged to have identified healthcare providers, revealed information about AB's mental health, medical status, or treatments, and gave out information that court reveal CD that could reveal CD, AB, and the mother's identity. So it's not that he was thrown in jail for mis fucking gendering his kid. Again, Arthur, homie. The hair on your head left just like every brain cell you have left. He went to jail for violating a court order, providing private information about his child, and identifying information about his child to a group of people who are already angry. So this is what I'm talking about. People like this man, here we have here, Arthur C. Shaper, just lie. They just lie. So, and if he's not lying then he's ignorant. So this is, there's two things, either he's a liar or he's stupid. I refuse to believe he's stupid. So I think he's just a liar. Big Pharma making big money. It's about taking advantage of children that have serious problems. I'm making a personal story here. I hope you're listening. Okay, <laughs> this is like, this is horrendous stuff. These children are confused. They have mental health issues. Oh, I wish and I was They the shouldn't show. be stigmatized. I I be very clear. Because I would have stopped, I would have stopped him in his tracks. I'm like, that's not why that guy went to jail. You're lying about that. But the answer isn't to put them under the knife or put chemicals into them that will alter them permanently. I don't necessarily believe that anybody's pushing anybody to be trans. Like when you're like, leave the kids alone. Hey, it's like, look at how you talk about trans people who would want to be trans in that sense. Like who would want to be pushing somebody into that lifestyle to but be trans. It is treated. happening. Hey, let's, I'm let's sorry. Let him talk. I, I'm, let him I'm talk. So <sighs> That I'm, I'm passionate about. I'm sorry. How many friends I've had who've been mutilated? Hey, 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 hey. Just because you might not have been able to make that at that age doesn't Someone mean everybody that's off. 16 or 17 can't make that choice at that age. There's so many 16 and 17 year olds who have been emancipated, who have been, you know, not emancipated, but when they take care of themselves legally and like their own, their their own legal guardian. At that age, they're making that specific decision that I'm old enough and mature enough to make this decision for myself and my life. Like just because you couldn't do it doesn't mean somebody else can't. Yeah, I, I just I, to, to, to disagree. Just the laws disagree with that, right? So we have laws against again against marriage, joining the military, um, alcohol, drugs, See, that's all these not sorts of things. But that has nothing to do. Laws against marriage because parents can override those laws. So that's not entirely true. With yeah, them as let's, people. Let's, yeah, but overall. Um, yeah, there are laws against these things, and so we're talking about people. We're talking about a group of people who believe in Santa, right? You're seeing, you're seeing younger and younger people get uh, transitioned, right? You're talking about people with this tenuous, tenuous grip on reality. There's no reason we should be pushing sex. When I was 13, 14, I was thinking about uh, my friends, video games, sports. Let's uh, Almost. go to the undecided. Which side do you guys resonate with most? Oh, 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 shit. So I actually want to pick up right where we left off. How old are you? 17. Have you gone through different? All right, two things I'm going to say before we hear, before we hear, before we hear these guys' opinions. One, I think the framing of the question is really disingenuous. Um, intuitively, we would all agree that minors are incapable of making severe life-changing decisions. Right. Intuitively, we would all agree with that. If a minor came up and said, I want to quit school, we would all tell them no. If a minor came up and said, I want to start smoking heroin, we would all say no. Right. So intuitively, we all have that I idea. But when it comes to transition, when it comes to gender affirming care, minors are not making that decision. That decision is being made by doctors and therapists and parents. When they look at, I'll, I'll say it again, they're making a benefit risk analysis. They're going, is it going to be more beneficial that my kid goes through gender affirming care 
based on the relevant information we know about my kid's mental condition, mental health state, what is going to be the best form of treatment? So I, I do think the question is framed disingenuously. Phases throughout your life. When I was three and four, I really wanted to be famous. I wanted to be a movie star. I wanted to be a singer. Um, when I was six to seven, I wanted to rule the world, actually, quite literally. Wait, I'm I sorry. Thought I, I thought I'd do a great job. If, if my six-year-old comes up to me and goes, I want to be a singer, I'm going to get them into singing lessons. Why is that a crazy thing? I thought I knew everything. Um, one thing I really wanted to do, and I was really into this idea, was building islands and taking all my friends and family there, and like we could have our own little community type of thing. Um, and then you when I was that. basically like 12, I think 13 maybe, basically up to 15, I was really into the idea of becoming an endocrinologist because of mm -hmm. the awesome endocrinologist I had. And then when I was 16, so this would have been last year, um, kind of realized after failing chemistry that maybe medicine was not for me. So um, I took a government class that I loved and I've always had a love of politics and that sort of stuff. So now I'm kind of focused on getting into international relations and politics. Well, I mean, at we least you're plan. doing the famous part well right now. <laughs> um, so you went through different, you know, four to five different but stages. But these aren't but talking about like identity. You're not talking, none of these are identity based. That's what I'm saying, bro. None of these are identity based. On the liberal side at the moment, can you explain up, why you decided to step on this stage? There are certain age groups that probably should not be making life altering decisions like three to four year olds, absolutely not. But it does ultimately, I do think, parents do need to be involved with that just because parents do oftentimes have their best children, their children's best interests at heart, even if at times to the public or to the child, it seems unfair. So I agree, but maybe just a little less with the conservative side this time. People also have said that you don't even develop your prefrontal cortex until you're 25. You know, I'm 26 and I feel like I can probably resonate <laughs> with that. I think the conservative side kept bringing up how there's certain things that you can't do, like in certain age groups. I think they're talking about like um, joining the military, uh, drinking, but in Europe you can drink at 16. Um, in the US you can drive at 16, but in other countries, Middle Eastern and European, you can't drive till 18. So how do we determine like, in actuality, Damn, she's spitting with what that. the limits are. Do you spitting guys have any thoughts amongst you you two of uh, what made you guys go to the conservative side? I'd love to hear a discussion between you two. The one thing that really resonated with me is, is we're talking, I think he said, we're talking about kids who, people who still believe in make-beliefs. Why? Okay, so one of the things we have to address here, they use this all the time. They say, well, why do kids believe in you know we can't let kids transition these kids still believe in santa claus why do kids believe in santa claus because a trusted adult told them santa is real <laughs> right if if you raise your kid to never believe in santa they're not gonna believe in santa oh my god and then the kids that do i'm sorry guys they're playing they're using their imagination. This is a good thing. I've never met a kid who has an imaginary friend who truly believes that imaginary friend is real. They're playing. I just don't think they understand the gravity of the situation. Maybe not just transitioning, but there's certain decisions that they don't understand the gravity of. I would push back a little. I think like, especially when it comes to teenagers, I would say like 15, 16, I would say high school range. I think like, we should probably give them a little bit more credit. I think, you know, when it comes to something like that, I mean, I would say, like, I think it's, of course, you know, it's, I mean, we're talking about minor, it's a huge range, but I think yeah. we should, in general, give a little bit more credit where it's due to them. I yeah. will say, the reason I'm here is because I think I just agree fundamentally with the idea, like, making life-altering choices. I don't think, mm -hmm. you know, anyone under the age of 18, I guess, maybe might be arbitrary, but, you know, in that minor range, as we've defined it in this country, I would agree. I don't think, you know, life-altering, whether that's a medical transition or even something like, you know, like what school you go to, like what college. I mean, you know, minors make decisions like that all the time, but they're not most of the time, and I would hope, usually they're not, you know, completely on their own. You know, we have support systems, and I think mm -hmm. what's really important is that we extend those support systems, so like counseling and, you know, people at schools and, you know, educating parents so that students aren't going into decisions completely on their own. Minors should be allowed to medically transition. Absolutely not. That has not changed for me. Oh, We're talking about uh, mental health issues. And there are a that. whole host of problems that children deal with when they're struggling with identity or gender dysphoria. Let's treat those issues. Let's treat those causes. I have mentioned numerous cases of former former trans kids who were pushed into it, parents who tried to protect their kids and were punished no, for doing you've lied multiple times. You have lied. And we have shown where you have lied. 
So no. Doing so. This is a very fraught affair. This, these are irreversible, damaging procedures, and we have so many detransitioners that are coming out. Warn hey, real quick, real quick. Just somebody, uh, maybe one of you guys can correct me on this. If it's irreversible, how are there detransitioners? Just a question. Just if it's irreversible, how are they detransitioning? I'm just interested. I, I, maybe it's just me. I'm just wondering. Learning the next generation not to do this. I think it's worth mentioning that the detransitioners, while I do sympathize with them, and I think it's unfortunate that the medical system has failed them, they're a statistical anomaly in the grand scheme of how many people have True. transitioned medically and surgically. That's We don't know that, though. So the yes, issue we is we don't know yes, what the detransition rate. Yes, we do. It's like 3% at the, at the max maximum 3% really is simply because they're falling off the rolls. If you don't have your primary sex organs removed, then you can literally stop taking hormones and nobody's following up on them. Also, we also know that the, uh, the longest study out is the five year study and the average detransition takes place four to 10 years after. And so those people are not being counted in those studies. I think that we should be working on mental health coverage we should be getting them to an age of a, age of adulthood. Um, also, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna say this as well, really quickly. Why should we w be worried about detransitioned adults? I don't think we should even be looking at those numbers, right? Because it, it kind of doesn't matter. If your whole premise, based on, let me, let me rephrase, it doesn't matter based on their logic. The conservative logic is, well, once you're 18, you can do whatever you want. So the only numbers we should really be focused on are de kids that detransition. So you only, like, it would, wouldn't make sense to follow up with, like, adults that have transitioned to adulthood. Um, we shouldn't be mutilating them um, as at a young age. And, and, and I think that they, That's like he said, is. like, your prefrontal cortex is where you make impulse decision making. And so that's what develops last. And so we should be getting them there. I think we can look at. So take this to its logical conclusion. And this is the issue. If we're saying, hey, it's about the way your prefrontal cortex is developed. Great. So are you saying people can't transition until they're 25? Is that what we're claiming? No, she's trans. She's, she's trans. She's a trans woman. So are we saying that people can't transition until they're 25 years old? Because that's when your prefrontal cortex is developed? No, nobody's saying that, right? Social transition? It's not about your prefrontal cortex. It's not what it, it's not actually what their argument is. Social transition might not be a zero sum game because we see that it kind of generally leads to transition, but let them socially transition, get them to adulthood and then see where we're at. I agree. Let them socially transition, use hormone blockers, start cross hormones at an appropriate age when the body is ready to be receiving cross hormones later on. I also agree that we shouldn't be mutilating children. I don't believe anyone's being <coughs> mutilated, but surgery doesn't have to happen before 18 if they are already being treated with cross hormones or hormone blockers, and we can wait until they're 18 if we are helping them and affirming their gender. I don't believe anybody has an agenda of chopping children up. Yeah, I would just say ultimately those who are promoting this and those who are accepting it will be accountable. We're seeing a lot of different lawsuits coming out. Uh, there's a transgender or detransitioner who is now suing Kaiser Permanente to help in, um, in like San Jose area because she felt like she, um, she, he, I don't even know what gender they are, but um, they felt like they were. Um, Yo, me and made the this. same face at the same time. <laughs> we made the same exact face at the same exact time, bro. They were, they were tricked. They were kind of ran into that system and now they're suing. And you're gonna see a lot of rise of these lawsuits. And so yeah, just and to I finish, I would say that um, thrown out of court. children are too young to transition. I guarantee they they're can't gonna be fully out. grasp this concept. And then also it's just not true. And so we shouldn't be pushing it for kids. And I think the solution to this is accepting who you actually are. Wait, if, if your claim is it's not true, so we shouldn't be pushing it to kids, that I'm sorry, but that I can say the same thing about church. I can literally say the same shit about church. I can use the exact same argument. Are accepting your actual body, going through therapy, and you know, I'm a Christian, seeking the gospel. Letting, let, we're made in God's image and likeness, and so allowing God to speak into that through prayer and sacraments and, yes. 
I get the argument of, you know, you're not developing until you're 25, but if that's the case, then people shouldn't be experiencing anxiety and so on at 26 if that's going to be, like, the main point of argument. Like, you know, I started paying bills and working at 15, 16, and put myself through school. I bought my first car, 16, but my, my second car, my third car, all on my own, and I wish somebody at that time had looked at me and told me that I wasn't allowed to be making specific decisions for myself because, you know, I think that's on a person-to-person basis and I completely agree with you that if they're at that time, they're ready for that, then they're ready for it, and if they're not, they're not. So now let's see the final decision from the undecided group. Now undecided, what's your final decision? This is not that dramatic. So, what's been great about this video is that a lot of you guys have switched different spectrums. So let's start out with what made you go to the liberal side. Um, I think that you made some really good points um, about being able to um, start Here's developers. what I think brought people to the conservative side. You guys let some dude lie. You literally let some dude lie. Also, thank you H for subscribing over on uh, TikTok. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, you literally just let some let let the homeboy lie for in 54 minutes and nobody was pushing him on his lies and socially transition and like surgeries do not need to happen before 18. They can happen after, but as long as the they do happen after person can ask them, ask them for any show me an actual case where someone got bottom surgery before 17. Show me that case. I'd love to see it. Decide to start puberty blockers and decide to socially transition because what if they don't make it to 25? What if they're not still alive to transition at 25 when they're fully developed? So like, I just don't, um, sorry. And like, I see my cousin that I mentioned, um, I, I just, I can't imagine my life without them. And if they were not, like if they're not able to transition, um, you can apply for Jubilee. I can apply I know for a Jubilee the episode. I have on their life, Maybe and I, I just I can't imagine it. I'll fly out. I think for me, what made me come to the conservative side is I definitely think that social transitioning is acceptable. Um, I think of the case of like Angelina Jolie's um, daughter who went through a long, long phase of I guess. We were not entirely sure if it was gender dysphoria or not, but wanted to present as male and then came to an age when they did decide that that was something they no longer wanted to do. And so I, I really respect that opinion and I am also concerned about that. Okay, great. So that child probably was not showing immense levels of distress. So why would we put them on gender affirming care? Really, genuinely. We also, if we're not entirely sure like what the medical you know, transitioning has long-term effects or like the medicine itself on the brain development and all that stuff. I think we should just be very wary of letting children transition, even if it is with um, medical, you know, teams. Cause as you said earlier, science is constantly a changing field. I still lean very much towards the middle, but I think if I had to pick, I lean right now a little bit more on the conservative side. And I think, I think the point you made about how we just don't know really like the detransition rate. Transitioning is a process, you know, medical transition, also social transition. And you're absolutely right, you know, in 10 years from now, you know, someone's experience might not be the exact same. I'm not saying that that's the case for everyone. I'm saying that that's probably still not even the majority of people, but I do think it's still a significant amount to, to take into consideration. There's still a lot that maybe we just don't fully understand. And I think until we get to that point, I'll just err on the side of caution. At least that's how I see it. Clearly. Anyway, shout out to us for, for getting through this fucking Jubilee video, bro. Shout out to, shout out to us, chat. Uh, I gotta say, a lot of misinformation being spread in this video. A lot of it. Um, I feel like I did a decent job combating the misinformation that was spread. Uh, before we move on to our next... Uh, we're going to watch the Pierce Morgan interview with uh, Basim Yusuf next. Before we get on to that, I do just want to say, if you support my content and you want to see me continue to make more content, I'm going to be doing more videos like this. Uh, more more content like this where I do reaction content on both TikTok and Twitch. Uh, you should subscribe to me on both. Subscribe on TikTok. It is $2.99. Subscribe on Twitch. It's $4.99. Uh, Twitch.